If politicians stop using youth as talks, Nigeria will be a safe place to live in. That is according to Kogi State Governor Yahya Bello. And APC governors refer to Wiki's comment on the performance as baseless. This is Plus Politics. I am Kayode Ladeindi. Welcome to Plots Politics. The Kogi State Governor Yahya Bello has stated that Nigeria will be a safe place to live in when politicians stop the use of thugs and criminals during elections, adding that thugs who were used and dumped by politicians during elections transformed into criminal elements who terrorize Nigerians. He also added that contrary to what is in the public space, he won the November 16, 2019 governorship poll without the use of, in quote, boys or thugs. Electoral observers previously stated that the November 16, 2019 Kogi State governorship election was marred with violence and bloodshed. Joining us to discuss this, we have uh, Mr. Peter Egbedio, who is a security expert and a public affairs analyst. Good evening, Mr. Egbedio. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Plus TV. And uh, we also have uh, Mr. Hamed Buhari, who is a politician, a former presidential aspirant, and of course, a political analyst. Good evening, Mr. Buhari. Hi, there. Good evening. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's good to also know that uh, you, your name is as popular as, I hope I'm not patronizing you, as the president, so I don't need to distinguish whether there's any link or not. So I'm tired of doing that. So let's get talking. Quite um, debatable issue, I must say, that we are discussing tonight. I recall the first time the uh, US uh, government with their big stick on us was the aftermath of Kogi governorship election where people were denied visas. And uh, even though they didn't mention the state, the reaction from Kogi state uh, quarters suggested that uh, Kogi state government was fingered in that issue. But quickly, what do you think about this statement coming from the governor? Let me start with Buhari. And uh, whether you want to separate the messenger and the message, you can go ahead. Well, uh, thank you. Good evening, viewers. Um, clearly, um, what the Kogi state governor said with regards to uh, politicians inability or refusal to use talks would actually create um, progression for the country. It is true. Everybody knows that. Uh, there's no need to play to the gallery saying things like that will help to save the country. We know that is true. But the main issue here is what have they done as leaders to ensure that these boys who carry out these attacks, sometimes under the instructions, sometimes under the instructions of their own aides, what have they done so far to make sure that we do not have this kind of talks on ground when there is a, when an election comes. Because very clearly, what I want people to understand is the only reason why these people take part in this kind of, uh, you know, attacks or, you, you know, intimidation during electoral campaigns is because they're going to be paid something. Nobody does any of these things for free. Somewhere, somehow, they're being settled with very, very small money, sometimes very small gifts. So as a governor of the state, I would have loved him to come up to say, oh, in the last five years of my administration, I have been able to create an enabling environment for businesses to thrive that would, have, that would ensure that most of the poor guys in my state, especially the young ones, are gainfully employed. And when they're employed, they would not see any reason to be part of all of these kinds of mayhem that we see during the elections. So yes, uh, we had him loud and clear. Yes, it is what everybody has been saying, but what are the politicians doing to ensure that these people are reduced. Well, I, I want to make a promise. I'm going to be very, very personal. I'm going to mention some clear case examples of um, uh, 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 real-life realities when it comes to politicians and talks. 
and I'll get your comment on that. But let me quickly have uh, Iberdion's opening remark on this statement. How potent, how true is this statement from the Kogi State Governor? Well, what the governor has said is, I mean, it's common knowledge, it's an open secret. Um, the youth usually in societies like ours, sadly to say, is always the fighting arm of the political machinery. Hmm. And once that arm is demobilized, you will find that election cycles are usually safer, um, more, more transparent. Um, you don't see 50, 60 year olds snatching ballot boxes or or burning down um, the, the residences of our opposition figures. It's usually young people. So it's common knowledge, it's, 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 it's plain wisdom that once you demobilize the fighting arm or the political machinery, which the youth sadly always is in Nigeria, um, then most of the violence we see or the cycles of violence we see will diminish greatly. Okay, okay, Buari, like I promised you, uh, uh, you, you remember the controversy when we're trying to get the, to the root of Boko Haram, uh, we were reminded that this started as political supporters, political thugs, and uh, it became a monster that we are finding it difficult to handle. And the practical example I wanted to give you, I, I've covered politicians, I've covered their campaigns uh, several times, I've covered a politician who tried to be very gentlemanly, walked into the midst of people, and it wasn't a funny episode. He was almost lynched, he was almost attacked. Guess what? Instead of even using police or using security, other security agents, he was advised to get some kind of thugs to give him protection. And I'm asking, how have we grown to this level? And talking about what you refer to, how do we, you know, change the narrative? Um, you know, as you were speaking, I was actually, you know, trying to remember how I grew up, the town I was, which was uh, Pontagra. I was I'm from Pontagra in Niger State, and at the time where democracy returned. I remember very well that I was within the ages of those people who would naturally uh, disrupt electoral processes. Um, you know, but the thing is, I've never been involved. And so the big question is, why was I not involved? I would like to think that I was just fortunate to have had an education. I was just fortunate mm. to have had something going on for me that mm. makes me believe that um, this, style of, um, th this style of living will not get me to where I want to get to naturally with, with regards to how I could see young people, young boys like myself at that time, getting involved in ballot snatching, getting involved in creating mayhem around polling units and things like that. So I'm still going to take us back to the basics. Whether it's Boko Haram, whether it's the Niger Delta boys, whether it's electoral talks that come around every four, four years or anytime there's an election, the, the, the point still remains that education is key. Hmm. Without, an educa without us educating these people, they will never ever be, hope, be looking forward to living up to something that will be positive in their lives. The second thing that we must actually look at is how is government working hard to create an enabling environment for businesses to thrive? And when we talk about these things, we're not talking about government creating space within the government to uh, uh, employ people. No, we're talking about making businesses so easy to thrive so that more people can be in business and be able to um, employ more people. This is the only way we can take out people who have actually lost hope completely. Because the only thing that will make you join Boko Haram is because you believe that the promises from Boko Haram are greater than the promises from your own country or your own country's government. These are the issues. So in my, in my mind, in my opinion, if we cannot take education seriously, we're not ready. If we cannot think of what we can do about the economy to ensure that we create jobs, then we're not ready. Many people have said even the kidnappings on the streets or the, on the roads, on the highways, Boko Haram tribing, talks here and there, is as a result of uh, insecurity. I say no. Insecurity is the secondary pro problem. The primary problem is that these people are living for nothing. They believe in nothing. They cannot see themselves as people that would achieve anything. So if we cannot go back to creating the jobs for these people, and this is back to the governor of Kogi State, very clearly, if you can tell me, oh, in the last five years of my administration, I have been able to create... XYZ number of jobs for my people. I am telling you, during electoral campaigns or voting times, you will not see these people doing okay. those things that they do. Uh, they are uh, doing those things that they do because they have nothing they're living for. 
Awesome. Uh, uh, your point quite resonates with me. And uh, Egbedion, I'm looking at uh, these perspectives uh, uh, that he has brought in, and that gives me a whole lot of worry. Um, as much as it looks like the way out, how can we even start immediately to tell these boys that a politician who is asking you to carry weapons and fight, where are his children? A politician who is actually asking you to get somebody killed, the last one you did for them four years ago, did they get you jobs to do? How do we start this conversation? Because some of them even believe they can't go back to school. The first way to start this is to remove the, the, the influence that money has in politics in Nigeria right now, because we live in, a, in, a, in an impoverished society, sadly to say, because of that, because the survival threshold is, is, is very thin, people will do whatever it takes to feed themselves. They will, they will put themselves at risk. Um, so if, and most of these thugs know that the politicians are fighting for have children abroad, have their best assets abroad, so they believe that that is the only way for them to survive or get something for the political cycle. Once you are able to remove a lot of the money from the current, current political cycle, it will reduce the incentive for people to take, take arms or to, or to float to where the money is, so to speak. Because literally, you find lesser politicians with lesser war chest that when it comes to money, you find that these thugs don't gravitate towards them. The thugs go where the money is. They go where they believe there's money to, for them to, to, to make, to, even for that political cycle. So because of the... The, the, the huge influence that money, money politics has in Nigeria, you will find that inevitably people will head this way. If the government is serious on clamping down on people or, or, or the funding, or, or if INEC is eager to clamp down on the funding of, of politics in Nigeria, we will go a long way. If the security agencies also are able to track the flow of money um, around that period, you, it will checkmate a lot of these things that we're seeing. One of the things that we see as a result of the money influence in politics is that arms also proliferate into the country during election cycles. These arms are not purchased with chewing gum. They are purchased with hard money, with a lot of money. It's evident that the influence of money on politics right now is one of the reasons we're seeing the advent of violence in an impoverished society, because people will do whatever it takes to eat, to survive, and that's the only hope that they have. Okay, I, I like the fact that you are linking the issue of poverty and the violence, and it's so sad that someone will carry guns with some high cost of the bullets and what they will get might be far less than that. That is quite dangerous. But let me go back to Buari. Buari, I, I'm seeing a dangerous trend here, and uh, I'm looking at what we need to do in terms of punitive measures. Now, what two of you have done is more of advocacy, which is stronger, I agree. What about the punitive measure? You've talked about the proliferation. You've talked about how these weapons get to stay with these thugs or miscreants or street urchins, whatever name you want to give to them after the, the election. What about bringing punitive measures against electoral violence to have these men behind bars? I know what you can say, that uh, these men will still go and get them bailed out. But how do we make the law stronger? Yes. Um the laws have got to be stronger. Um, of course, um, when we talk about all of these things, you try to see how you can checkmate these problems, but you find another loop somewhere. You try to close that one, another one opens up again. And it's all, it all boils down to the fact that the constitution needs to be amended. The constitution needs to be fixed in such a way that nobody is above the law. As it stands right now, there are a lot of governors that can do whatever they like and nothing is going to happen. And that is because they can actually still use the constitution to protect themselves, to defend themselves, to get out of trouble whenever the time comes. I'm still going to say this, you know, there's no state governor or anybody who's going to be running for office. Um, it's going to be very hard to find anyone that says, I'm not going to give money during election so that I can forcefully um, win an election because it's all about money. You know, these people have get into those spaces and they're, they're able to, you know, access so much money that when they have invested so much during the campaigns, they do expect that they cannot lose. They should not lose. They must not lose. They cannot lose. So if, if, if that is happening to them, you cannot expect them to now say, oh, we're going to put all the measures in place to ensure that these talks do not get any access 
to the disruption of an electoral process. It's, it's a lie. They cannot do it. Even if they're going to claim that they do not know about it, people within their cabinet, people within their governments will make sure that they get back into office because at the end of the day, that is the only way they can survive. So yes, uh, Kaidi, it, it's, we're in a very bad situation. We're in a very problematic situation. And the only way we can have politics being run without money is if the constitution is going to be amended. If the electoral laws are going to be amended, that is where we're going to start saying, okay, fine, we have developed a system that is going to protect our democracy and ensure that only the right people get uh, elected into office. Buhari, let me stay with you. I'll go back to Bedion in a while. Uh, I, I, I'm looking at, I'll give you a very practical, another practical example. And sometimes I feel for someone like you, that irrespective of how eloquent and how awesome your programs are, it appears that the current system would never be in your favor. I'll give you an example. I'm not trying to be a, a prophet of doom. I covered a naysayer, naysayer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you an example, uh, Buhari. I covered an election, and uh, we're going to, it's even a rerun election. And when we got to the police station, we were told by the police, Omnium, some talks came to us and told us to carry our OB van out of that place, that we are not allowed to cover this election. And we have heavy presence of policemen. And we went to them that we are journalists, we are registered. You can see all the paraphernalia of a registered uh, journalist. And guess what? The police had to tell us that we need to go back, that they cannot guarantee our safety. We saw a clear connivance between these thugs and the policemen. And guess what? When we took off, we were chased with guns. We had to make calls to the headquarters in Abuja. They told us, OK, we should go back. The place is calm now. And like you said, a lot of things happened. Some miracles happened by the time we came back. And uh, our lives were at risk. I'm looking at a very precarious situation here. How do we have a sanitized system beyond some of the things you mentioned? You see why I'm a bit uh, <laughs> pessimistic about the chances of people who cannot hire talks? I, 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 I totally agree. I totally agree. I ran a campaign uh, from 2016 to 20. 2019. I'm, I'm glad to see Peter because Peter was one of my resource people at that time with advices and you know strategies as to how we could possibly work around our very very problematic poli uh, pro political space and see how somebody from nowhere uh, with no godfather with no money could actually convince the generality of the people that I have superior programs to the ones you've already been exposed to, but I do not have money to give to you. Um, we tried, we did our best, but the truth still remains that, like I started from the beginning, most of these people need money because they are not employed. They are not even employable. So when you see people like that, there is totally loss of hope. And they are ready to do anything during electoral processes, during elections, to ensure that whoever is paying them for whatever activities they're supposed to do is going to be the one that they will protect. They cannot even say, you know what, you know the thought, the, 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 the thought we had some years ago that if we introduce to these thugs uh, the, the fact that if I give money, if I, give, if, I, if I collect money from a politician, I do not have to vote for him. They cannot even find themselves thinking that way. So clearly, once, once they get into the space, you give them money. If I, if I give them money on a Thursday and the election is on a Friday, if I give them money on a Thursday, the person who gives them money on a Friday is the one they can remember. They have actually hmm. forgotten that I gave them money a day before. Hmm. That is how dangerous the situation is. So if, we're, if we are going to keep talking about these things and have no plans or any actions to see that we are dragging people out of the labor market and uh, we're dragging people from the, into the labor market and ensuring that uh, they're able to you know, fend for themselves, they're able to live up for what they believe in. If we're not able to do that, then... We're not, we're not running the country yet. We're not talking like people who truly want to see the end of these kinds of um, operations okay. from talks or from politicians. Okay. Uh, Peter, uh, uh, thank God two of you have some kind of common core where you, you meet. Uh, but Peter, look at the situation I painted to you. Do you blame young people or some sane people by being apathy towards our election? 
when you know that it's a free for all affair? Well, um, I don't blame them, to be honest. We, we live in a society, I mean, the saying that um, if you can't beat them, join them, is, is still applicable in many ways in this, in this scenario. Um, in, in, a, in the previous election cycle, I think it was 20, 2015, I remember a candidate I was also consulting for um, went to visit the traditional ruler, or he went to visit the traditional ruler. On his way to visit that ru traditional ruler, the youths of that community stopped him from getting access to the traditional ruler because they said he has not settled, and the other politicians who had come had settled. So even though the, the chief wanted to have audience with the candidate I was, I was consulting for, he wasn't granted access to him. In fact, those boys began to shoot into the air, and, and, my, and I had to call my candidate and say, please, I think you should leave that place. Um, because the youth are exposed to the, let me put it like this, the, the, the hope, the promises that if you do the wrong thing, and I have the power of the system to protect you, then you will reap dividends in the future. You will find most people, in fact, you've seen people sell them, sell their own parents for a mess of porridge. You've seen people who leave their own, I, I, I know someone whose own siblings and cousins refuse to mobilize political support for him because he didn't have money. He came back from America, was trying to get in the system. So I don't really blame people, who, young people who, who follow these politicians and go around because this system has been so weaponized, poverty has weaponized so much that it is almost stupid. You find people who say, you know what, just take the money. And even if you take the money, I mean, they have means of coming back to get at you tomorrow. It's okay, you didn't vote for me in your ward. I got only some amount of votes. And then they kill people for that, for just for not delivering their words. We saw it in Lagos um, sometime during the last governorship election. We saw live on TV with the former governor. We saw thugs fighting on TV. A prominent thug was stabbed and flown abroad, taking care of supposedly with state funds or something. But you, so when you find young people going this way, you don't blame them because the system has failed. And sorry to say, Nigeria, I mean, we saw some articles, um, a news article a few days ago that says, Nigeria is so simple of a failed state. I mean, that's just being being uh, being polite. In many ways, in many ways, this state has failed. And until certain things are done, which may not be done except with um, external force or or, or or force, things will always be like this. Sorry to say. Hmm. Sorry to say. Sorry to say. We must find a solution. And uh, Ahmed, still talking about solution, because my fear is, don't we have some good eggs among these? public officials? Don't we have people who can get into power without some level of thuggery? And irrespective of who the governor of Kogi State is, can we make some sense from what he said and begin to have some kind of sane political system? Oga okay, okay, we're just going to be going around in circles. Where are the jobs? It's these jobs that will actually help solve this problem. Hmm. You know, these guys have got to believe in something. No matter what you're going to do as a governor, if the, if, if the, if the smallest thing you're going to do is to create an, a, 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 an enabling environment where people can do business, we is to, I recognize those people who are doing business. And ima imagine microfinance banks, for example. They were, they were created to help alleviate some of these problems, to help give small businesses money to start doing one thing or the other. But they don't give money. They cannot trust that they can they, they give you money and you would actually be able to pay back. Why? Because we do not even have forwarding addresses. Many people in this country cannot be traced once they leave your vicinity. This is the truth. These are the places that our government has got to start from. Create Ahmed, an Ahmed. environment where, in fact, everybody Ahmed, can be tied Ahmed, to let me, a particular let me, address. Let me quickly interject. Uh, when you say where are the jobs, is it about the terrible economic state or there is a deliberate move by the political class not to get jobs for these people? I, I, really, I really don't know what the, the, the motive is. But for every sane space, those who had those spaces are always keen on what will the people eat? How will they eat? How will they fend for themselves? Nobody is asking them to create space within the government structures that to give people jobs or to... Well, all we are saying is simple. Create an enabling environment where if I want to do my business, I can do it comfortably and still be able to employ at employ least 50 people. people. That's about families. If, if, the, if we're not thinking of ways to do all of those things, then we're not ready. Then we're not ready to pull our people out of poverty while still using, uh, just the way Peter said it, 
we, we, we weaponized, we weaponized poverty and we, we now use it as a means, as a tool to undermine certain people and to mm. compel them to do it just the way we want them to do it. So if we want to keep talking about the statement from the Kogi State Governor from now to tomorrow, the bottom line is still going to go back to the fact that we need to get our people educated. We need and we must create an enabling environment for businesses to thrive. That is the only way we can slowly, you know, get some people out of the space of, you know, just intimidating people during electoral processes. And when these elections are over, nobody even looks at these guys until the next four years. They know these things. They know that they're being used, but they cannot do anything about it. Okay, Peter, I want you to speak to the youths now. Um, I'm talking about youths. In, maybe if you need to speak pidgin, go ahead. Whatever language they can hear you, it is important that we address them. It's not just enough for us to paint this gloomy picture. I believe that we can have some kind of sane system. Look at what happened in NSAS. We saw a lot of sane youth, educated youth, having a whole lot of influence in the polity. So how do we tell them to drop the guns and put on their thinking cap? Um, whenever you're listening or watching this from, and you're a young person in Nigeria who's, who's fed up with the process, um, I don't want you to give up hope. One of the things that we can do quietly or slowly um, is demand for electoral reform. Um, if we're able to push for electoral reform, be it with social media presence or lobbying, different different ways, that can change things some way. Because if we do start doing electronic voting, for instance, that, that can help guarantee one man, one vote truly, you will see that some of these things will change. However, the more we keep putting our heads together, the more we're going to find solutions. So I think it's a good time for young people to strategize, um, find people who are brilliant in your, in your spaces and collaborate with them. Whatever the incentive is for, 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 for violence, please, don't tow that, don't tow that line. We saw during the NSAS protests that many young Nigerians did not protest violently, that it was even the protection of thugs that, that, that spoiled, that spoiled the fray. However, we are mm -hmm. going back to the drawing board and another election cycle is around the corner. We can do this. Let's just keep collaborating, thinking of the best ways to make this possible. Electoral reforms is key. You, if, if you're from small places, you can, you can, you can work to recall current um, politicians who are, not, who are not doing their job properly. You can actually recall. There's a system for recall of politicians who are currently serving now. So okay. if you start to pressure on them like that, it can shake the system a bit, a bit and we can see some change. Okay. Thank you so much, Peter Igbedion, a security expert and a public affairs analyst. And of course, many thanks to you, Ahmed Buhari, for your insight. And trust me, I'm not a naysayer. One of these days, we'll have responsible electorate who will believe in you and who will believe in people like you to Amen. take the reins of power. Amen. <laughs> yes, thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, we'll take a short break now. And when we return, APC Governor's reply, Governor Yerson Wike, over his comments on the performance rating. This is up next for discussion. Please don't go anywhere.